Antonio starts right now. Hi, good morning. It is Thursday, October 22nd. Great news if you work for HEB as a partner. You're about to get $500 direct deposited in your account tomorrow. That's right. So San Antonio based grocer HEB has announced that it will hand out $500 bonuses to all of its employees as a thank you for facing each obstacle with grace, compassion, strength and resilience in 2020. Yep. Uh, the bonuses for every partner full time or part time. HEB's president Craig Boyan released a statement says in part at HEB our success starts with our people in the face of many challenges this year. Our partners have confronted each obstacle with grace, compassion, strength and resilience. Our partners continue to raise the bar in pursuit of excellence, uplifting and inspiring people across our great state and beyond. He also says as we look toward the holiday season and to 2021, it's with immense pride and great excitement we celebrate our partners and their families for the passion and heart they exhibit every day to Texans across our great state. Yes, yeah, thank you to all the partners at HEB. You guys have been awesome. According to the email, partners are also getting a thank you card a pair of socks with the HEB logo and a shirt from one of their brands. Very cool. HEB stores along with other grocery chains have remained open throughout the pandemic as they are designated as essential businesses. And boy, did we see them step up, especially when the pandemic first hit. Oh yeah, and continuing now, their slogan is here, everything is better, and it especially is if you work there, right? Yeah, I, definitely. Uh, this is well-deserved. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Let's take a look at today's top stories in your nine at nine. U.S. intelligence officials say there has been an attempt to disrupt the upcoming presidential election. We have confirmed that some voter registration information has been obtained by Iran and separately by Russia. President Donald Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden will face off tonight in the final debate before Election Day. You can watch it live right here on Case at 12 at 8 p.m. The Senate Judiciary Committee has voted to advance Judge Amy Coney Barrett's Supreme Court nomination to the full Senate. This despite Democratic senators refusing to show up for the vote. A final confirmation vote is expected Monday. The U.S. reported more than 1,100 new COVID-19 deaths yesterday. Doctors now say the pandemic could be more devastating this fall and winter than it was when it first swept over the U.S. An important advisory board for the Food and Drug Administration is set to hold its first meeting on COVID-19 vaccines virtually today. The committee made up of a group of experts who advised the FDA on whether to approve drugs that have gone through a rigorous approval process. Purdue Pharma, the maker of OxyContin, has agreed to plead guilty to three federal criminal charges for its role in creating the nation's opioid crisis. The company will pay more than $8 billion in fines. The American Civil Liberties Union says it's been unable to reach the parents of 554 migrant children taken from their families at the U.S. border with Mexico before June of 2018. The Department of Homeland Security is denying the accusations. Quibi is calling it quits. The streaming service built on short videos meant for your phone has shut down after six months in business. Investors lost an estimated $1.4 billion. The first space station crew to launch during a pandemic back in early April has returned to Earth. The three astronauts touched down in Kazakhstan earlier today, and that's today's Night and Night. We'll catch you up on the other news of the day coming up here in our first block. But first, let's check with Justin Horn about two cold fronts. Yeah, we're still uh, banking on two fronts headed our way. There have been a few changes though the forecast, a lot of moving parts here. Uh, let's start with some of the headlines. It's going to be another repeat today, warm and humid, and then the front arrives by tomorrow afternoon. So tomorrow we think that front will be here after the lunch hour. That'll cool us down some. It'll bring some breezy winds. It'll be fairly cool for Friday night football, and we're trending cooler on Saturday. More clouds and temperatures may not get out of the 70s, uh, so it looks like it could be a little bit of cool, a cooler weekend, at least on Saturday. There's the cloud cover right now. We have a few showers out there that have uh, been working through. We've seen this pretty much each and every day this week. It's a very similar pattern today, mostly cloudy. A couple showers here and there. Temperatures in the mid 70s at the airport, 75 degrees, 70 Bernie State, 72 Tarpley. Extended forecast. We should be up around 89 this afternoon. Southeast Julie winds 5 to 15 miles per hour. Again, those changes arrive tomorrow. Next week, 
brings even more uh, difficulties to the forecast. We're going to uh, look into that. Green also including the frontage road. Keep that in mind if you're traveling out in that part of our area. It looks like it's going to be there for a little while. Late breaking news this morning, a San Antonio police officer arrested and charged with DWI. Officer Rafael Hernandez III was seen driving about 100 miles per hour and swerving out of the shoulder of Loop 410 near I-10. That's when he was pulled over and officers determined he was driving under the influence. Hernandez has been with the department for three and a half years. He's being placed on administrative leave during the investigation. Well, new this morning at 9, San Antonio police have had a busy start of the day with multiple accidents all over town. Over on the south side, police say a man was hit by a 65-year-old woman on her way to work. They tell us the man was walking on the access road of I-35 near Zarzamora just before 7 this morning. Now, officers tell us the woman didn't see the man because it was dark and he was wearing dark clothing. Investigators say the woman hit him with her van was dragged about uh, 50 yards. He was taken to the hospital with life threatening injuries. Police say the woman stayed at the scene and is not facing any charges. Police also investigating another incident where two men who were loading plumbing equipment into their truck were hit by the driver of a gray SUV. This one happened just after 630 this morning on the north side. Police tell us the driver turned from the corner of San Pedro onto Sahara and hit the men at a high rate of speed. One of the victims was taken to the hospital in critical condition. The other only suffered minor injuries. Investigators say they're still looking for the suspect who sped away from the scene. Third incident where a man was hit by a pickup truck trying to cross the street near the medical center is still under investigation. It happened just after 630 this morning at the intersection of Hebner Road and Golden Quail Road. Police tell us the victim was taken to the hospital and is in stable condition. Investigators say the woman who hit him stopped to call for help. It's not expected to face any charges. Officers tell us two other vehicles also crashed into the woman's pickup truck, but neither driver was hurt. Other top stories we're following today. Police are investigating two overnight robberies on the northeast side and the other on the northwest side. First one we want to tell you about happened just before four this morning at a 7-Eleven near Judson and Independence Avenue. Police tell us three men walked into the store. One of them punched the clerk in the eye. Officers say the suspects then broke open the ATM and left. Investigators tell us the men did not take the machine and they're not sure if anything was taken. The suspects were last seen running towards Independence Avenue and at last check have not been caught. The other robbery happened around 3.30 at a Circle K in the 9300 block of West Loop 1604, not far from New Gilbo Road. Police tell us a man in black clothing and a mask walked into that store, pointed a gun at the clerk and demanded money. The suspect then ran away. Investigators are still unsure about how much money was stolen. A new episode of Case Out Explained is now out to stream on demand. This week, the team is explaining what it means to treat racism as a public health crisis, something the San Antonio City Council decided to do. Our Myra Arthur has a preview of this week's episode. Back in August, the City Council formally passed a resolution declaring racism a public health crisis in San Antonio. And then came the questions. What exactly does that mean? And what is the city's plan to make changes? In this week's episode of KSAT Explains, we start by talking to three San Antonians about their own experiences with racism. It's affected their lives in ways that you might not expect, and it lends an intimate and personal voice to what's been a nationwide conversation on race happening these last several Several months. We also talked to doctors about the way they see patients of color impacted here in San Antonio and what's at the root of those negative health effects. The reasons run much deeper than simply not eating right or getting enough exercise. There's a long history there when we take the time to explain. And we hear about the potential drawbacks of declaring racism a public health crisis. Why one take you'll hear in this episode centers around the possibility of perpetuating negative stereotypes. You can watch KSAT Explains Racism as a Public Health Crisis anytime on KSAT.com and the KSAT TV app. In the newsroom, I'm Myra Arthur. In your morning headlines, dramatic body cam video showing California police pulling a woman out of a burning car. Officer Pangley says he was closest to the scene when the call came out. When he arrived, the fire was spreading fast through the car and the dry grass, and he realized the woman was trapped and not moving. That's when he pulled her out of the car and dragged her by the wrist to safety. Investigators don't know exactly what led up to the fiery crash, but they say the driver was arrested for DUI. Officer Lee was not hurt.
A helicopter pilot walking away from a crash on Long Island's Jones Beach Inlet alive. Investigators say they don't know exactly why it happened, but they say the helicopter fell uh, about a thousand feet in three seconds. A boater who witnessed the crash rushed to the scene to help the pilot and recorded this video of him walking away from the chopper. I can't even believe it happened. It was just uh, surreal and I was glad to be there to help him. And even like the police were saying like, thank God you were there to help him because they wouldn't have found him in that fog. It was so thick and dense. So I was in the I guess, right place at the right time. The 64 year old pilot is expected to be OK. Colorado Parks and Wildlife say a neighborhood in El Paso County has seen deer attacks in four days. One of them caught on camera. Video shows a buck following a woman for about a half mile. All of a sudden, the deer puts its head down and rams into the back of the woman's legs. Investigators believe the attacks are happening because someone's been feeding them. Uh, wildlife officers say feeding deer makes them get used to humans, and once they lose their fear, they can sometimes become aggressive. How scary. Time now is 9.09 .09 and still ahead on GMSA at 9. You ever seen a green dog before? No, this puppy was not dyed green. He was born that way. Out experts say this might have happened. And from the beginning of early voting through the eighth day of early voting, which was on October 20th, more than 3.1 million people had voted in person and by mail in the, large, in the state's largest counties. Now, will the big turnout so far give either party an edge? We're going to check in with Alana Rocha from the Texas Tribune later in the newscast. What a beautiful Thursday morning. Arts and crafts, and it's all about culture, la cultura. We're celebrating Dia de los Muertos, and Chef Johnny Hernandez is doing it in a very special way with an altar and a painting kit. How you can get your hands on one, the info just ahead here on GMSA at 9. And welcome back. It is 9.13. After years of traveling through Mexico for inspiration to create a vibrant menu at his multiple restaurants, including La Gloria, Burgoteca, and Fruteria, Chef Johnny Hernandez says he realized something was missing. Across the world, cultural celebrations are intertwined with food and beverage, which is why, with the help of HEB, he's created a Day of the Dead altar kit for kids and families. Our Alicia Pereira is live from La Gloria with more on the altar activity and how to get your hands on one. Good morning. Good morning. Well, there are about 800 of these altar kits and inside are these beautiful handmade materials from Michoacan, Mexico. And the purpose is for families and kids to dive in deeper to the culture and of course, preserve Dia de Muertos. Perfectly created boxes full of culture and history were shipped directly by the famous Torres family from West Central Mexico. Uh, Velia helped us assemble all the kits from all the different producers in Michoacan. And they have arrived to Casa Hernan in Southtown just in time for one of the most colorful celebrations of the fall. And that's a big part of, uh, of why I'm so involved in Day of the Dead because it is one of those cultural celebrations that brings people together, brings family together, community and there's always food. Chef Johnny Hernandez says he wants San Antonio to fully embrace Dia de Muertos. It, it, we are a cultural city. We are a gateway to Mexico and our population here is, is Latino. It's, it's important that we share this education of Day of the Dead community wide and beginning with the kids is, is really where it, it, it starts, right? You nurture them, you teach them. <laughs> So what better way to learn than by doing? This altar kit is made for a small table. And, and what's also very customary is to create different levels, right? You can actually use the box to create a level, you know, on the back of the altar. Marigolds, decorated sugar skulls, hand cut papel picado, ceramic pieces and more are all included in the lesson. You know, the friends and family that are making that journey, right? That spirit that's traveling, you have the nourishment of the bread, the quenching of their thirst. The salt is for preservation, so there's always uh, sal de grano on the altar. And if you get lost in the process, the kit also features a spirit that will help guide you through a QR code. I am Camila La Catrina, a Day of the Dead symbol that represents death and the afterlife. Camila walks you through the assembly of the altar and, and talks about all the elements, uh, little buttons you kind of push, push through. And a cultural activity where heaven, earth, and technology meet. This tradition originates from indigenous Mexican communities, and over the centuries, it has been melded.
breathtaking these materials in handmade in Michoacan, Mexico, West Central Mexico, making all the way here to San Antonio. And another part that he is focusing on is also painting. Earlier you saw me painting this um, paper mache skull and it comes with, of course, your brush and then a variety of paints that we have hidden back here. And this will also be distributed uh, to kids around San Antonio, thanks to Chef Johnny Hernandez, as well as HEB. Mark, Stephanie? Alicia, how can people get their hands on either of these kits? Yes, so that is the big question. Again, about 800 of the altar kits. It's unknown how many of these paper mache painting kits, but HEB, we did reach out to them and they're still figuring out those details. So you want to stick with us on ksat.com because we'll be updating on the story exactly when and how you'll be able to get your hands on one. So hopefully that'll be happening soon. Live from La Gloria, Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Alicia. Yes, hopefully soon. I know a lot of people have a lot of interest. Every year it seems to grow. In fact, um, at my daughter's school, it used to be every year about this time they were supposed to be making pumpkins. This year they're supposed to make an altar. Ah. So, okay. They will be in demand. <laughs> this they will definitely be in demand. We'll again pass along those details mm -hmm. as soon as possible. Justin rejoins us now with a forecast that's acting a bit like a three-year-old without a nap, a bit of a challenge. <laughs> so true, and I know how that is. Uh, yes, we've got a couple cold fronts coming through, and we're going to be all over the place with temperatures. So just get ready next seven days. So let's first start with the early voting forecast, though. If you're heading out today to go vote. Still looks pretty good. You may want to grab an umbrella. We have a couple showers out there this morning, but I think by the afternoon, not a big deal. Mostly cloudy noontime, 81, 85 by 2 o'clock. We'll be up around 89 by 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock, 88. We're pretty used to this by now. This week has been pretty consistent. Again, it all starts to change tomorrow. Look at that. A few drops right now on our live cam. 75 degrees. There are a couple showers out there. We'll show you the radar in just a second. Humidity is way up there, so it's sticky. And the dew points are in the 60s and 70s. Uh, there's the visible satellite picture. Quite a bit of cloud cover, so we start off mostly cloudy. These clouds, like the last few days, will scatter out. And with some of these clouds, we're seeing a few showers, especially down towards Pleasanton. A few light returns here around Bear County, then also around New Braunfels as well. There's a little closer look at that area of maybe some heavier rain just to the west of I-37. This may work its way up into Pleasanton here over the next uh, 30 minutes or so. A couple showers around Carn City, and we've seen a few light returns even here in San Antonio. Bigger picture, you see the snow up north, quite a bit of it. Some record snow for Minnesota, the Dakotas. We've been talking about that the last few days, and the numbers are starting to come down. 11 in Cub Bank, 27 in Casper. This tells us this cold air is ready to spill south. We're going to feel some of it, especially as we get into next week. So here's a look at our future cast going forward, and we're going to fast forward to 5 o'clock tomorrow. So here's our first front. With it, we could get a shower or two. I think rain chance is really probably on the low end with this front, which you're going to notice more of the winds picking up and the clouds filling in. So Friday night football potentially could be a little bit chilly. Temperatures in the 60s, some gusty winds. And then as we get into Saturday, this is where the forecast has changed a little bit. We think clouds are going to hang around. Some of that colder air is uh, going to try to filter in maybe a little bit more on Saturday. So we've lowered temperatures quite a bit on Saturday. Sunday, we warm right back up. Uh, humidity will come back in. Temperatures could be up close to 90 on Sunday, so there's a change. And then here is the next front, and this one will be stronger on Monday. It looks like it'll be just afternoon. We'll start to get some of that cool air moving in with this. We can see a couple of showers as the front moves in. And then the cold air will sort of filter in more so on Tuesday. I think Tuesday has the potential to be one of those cloudy, really sort of cool days with some breezy winds. We'll have some showers around and look at that. Maybe some snow in the Texas Panhandle. It'll be that cold with this system. And I think we'll continue to get some rain even into Wednesday morning. Our rain chances look pretty good with this. I don't know that we'll get a ton of rain, but it will be one of those situations where we may get drizzled, just some light rain pretty persistently over the Tuesday to Wednesday period. And, and look at the roller coaster temperatures here. So 89 today, 82 tomorrow, 70 on Saturday. We jump back up to 87 Sunday and then right back down Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So just be prepared, you know, with the jacket. Uh, you may need some shorts on Sunday and then switch back. Monday into Tuesday. 89 degrees today, just a 10% chance of rain. We'll go 82 tomorrow, 70 on Saturday, mostly cloudy, jumping up on Sunday, and then breezy Monday with a 20% chance of showers. But we've upped our rain chances now to a 40% chance Tuesday and Wednesday with temperatures in the 60s, guys.
You are right. It is all over the place, but something for everyone, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and this is what we would expect this time of year. We've kind of been waiting on these fronts and they're they're finally here. Glad to see it. Thank yep. you, Justin. Fantastic news. Thank you, Justin. 921, 75 degrees. And still ahead on GMSA at 9, many people lost their homes due to the wildfires in California. How a nine-year-old girl is stepping up to make sure kids who lost their homes still get to enjoy Halloween. Some good news this morning. A nine-year-old girl in Central California didn't want kids to lose their homes or who lost their homes in this year's Creek Fire to lose out on celebrating Halloween. So Arna, or excuse me, Arna Chalasani posted a video on GoFundMe asking for help to create Halloween goodie bags. She ended up raising $1,200 to make 130 packs. Chalasani is using the rest of the money to buy winter jackets for kids who lost everything. A Colorado cancer survivor is planning to run four full marathons in 24 hours in order to raise $50,000. Money is meant to help two charities dedicated to helping dogs rescued from dog fighting, neglect, and cruelty. Dan Egler. It's a fight for the control of the Texas House with Democrats nine seats away from the majority. How Republicans are being forced to answer for votes in a way they have never had to before. Alana Rocha with the Texas Tribune will break it down later in the newscast. Here in Texas, more than 3.1 million people have voted in person and by mail in the state's 10 largest counties. That's about 32% of registered voters in those counties. The November 3rd election will also determine the balance of power in the Texas House for next year's legislative session. Experts are reporting that Republican lawmakers who have held the majority since the 2003 session face the first truly competitive general election. Alana Rocha with the Texas Tribune joins us now to talk more about the Texas House fight and the upcoming election. Good morning, Alana. Good morning. Good morning, Alana. Uh, according to the TRIB, from the beginning of early voting through the eighth day of early voting, which was October 20th, more than 3.1 million people voted in person and by mail in the Texas largest counties. It appears there are a record number of people heading to the polls. How does this compare to 2016? And do we know if the turnout we're seeing gives either party an edge? You know, it's too early to answer a lot of these questions, being that uh, we don't register Democrat, Republican in the state. We don't know who exactly is turning out or, or how they're voting, I should say. Uh, there are more people uh, turning out. Uh, Part of that is there are more people in Texas. You know, two, nearly two million more are registered uh, in 2020 than were the last presidential election in 2016. Um, and it's a question too, if, if ultimately more people vote or if a lot of people are just voting early uh, because of the pandemic and because the governor extended early voting. Of course, Democrats see promise in high turnout uh, numbers in the major metropolitan areas that often uh, lean Democratic, but Republicans registered a lot of new voters as well. And in Denton County up in the Dallas area, they had surpassed their 2016 turnout of 18% by last Friday. So on day four of early voting and through Tuesday, they were at 40%. So it's, it's a sizable increase. And Alana, moving to the fight for the control of the Texas House, Democrats are nine seats away from in the majority after picking up 12 seats back in 2018. There are reports that Republican lawmakers who have held the majority since the 2003 session face the first truly competitive general election and that they are being forced to answer for votes in a way they have never had to before. Can you give us some examples? Uh, yeah, uh, Jeff Leach up in uh, the Plano, Dallas area is, um, you know, he says he regrets his vote on the bathroom bill, the controversial legislation in 2017 uh, that regulated which uh, bathrooms transgender Texans can use. Over in uh, Richardson, also in the Dallas area, Angie Chen Butner, a longtime Republican incumbent, recently said that she uh, would support Medicaid expansion. That's a big uh, shift in positions. Um, you know, Republicans have been largely against that as part of the Affordable Care Act for, for years now. So, yeah, they're facing their first real competitive races. Um, and, you know, in the flip side, Republicans are painting Democrats as uh, too liberal for Texas and in line with national Democrats. Democrats are hopeful they can flip those nine seats in the state house to gain a majority in the lower chamber. And we're told that Asian voters will likely be 
succeeding, uh, the, uh, be key rather to them succeeding. Why is that? Uh, because they're the largest uh, racial uh, ethnic voting group, um, largest or fastest growing, I should say, uh, in the country. And that's true here in Texas. They only make up 5% uh, share of the population. But again, they're growing fast and they're growing fast in districts uh, that Beto O'Rourke won in uh, 2018 over Ted Cruz. So Democrats are targeting those areas. Um, of course, they're not a monolith. They don't all vote the same. Uh, different segments of the Asian population lean one way or another. But recent polling suggests that they are uh, expected to turn out in larger numbers uh, for uh, Democrats. Pardon the toddler. All right, Alana, the Texas Tribune and her correspondent right next to her. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, thanks for the assist. Thank you, guys. Alana keeping Remy in check. Yes, how cute. Glad Mom, to have her on the show. Mommy was working and both did an awesome job. Yes, I think so. Yes. Back outside right now with live cam. Back over to Justin with an update. And uh, is this a new pollen count? It is. So we got the new pollen count in. Both mold and ragweed are low, although I've, I've seen some skepticism on uh, Facebook of people saying, hey, I'm sneezing right now. But th those are the numbers this morning. Mold is low, a ragweed low, 340 and 30 respectively. And the looking at the visible satellite picture, we've got a lot of cloud cover stretching all across our viewing area. A couple showers, too. We're seeing that uh, down near Pleasanton, but also here in San Antonio. A few uh, sprinkles and a few light returns coming through. See the returns there, Corral, Victoria, over to Carn uh, City. And the temperature is plenty warm, 75 degrees at the airport, 74, Hondo 73 in Tarpley. Our forecast today takes us up close to 90. No surprise, right? That's where we've been all week. There are changes, so some big changes in the forecast. We're going to talk more about those fronts and some cooler temperatures now coming up here in just a few minutes. Guys. Thank you, Justin. Taking a look out with Transguide this morning, there is a shot there at 281 and looking at 35 there. Uh, there was another part of 35 earlier where we had construction, so watch out for that. And But things looking okay there on Highway 90. There you go. And there it is, 35 <laughs> at FM 1103. Only one side of the freeway, though. You know, it's so much more than a children's movie. For many people, Coco is a warm and lovely introduction to Mexican culture. Others, it's a film that celebrates customs that has existed for ages. If you've never seen it before, Coco is a story of a young Mexican boy named Miguel who journeys through the world of his ancestors on the Day of the Dead. Isis Romero takes uh, us to some of the sites that in Mexico that inspired this film. <laughs> From the statue of Mexican singer Jorge Negrete that inspired the shrine to Ernesto de la Cruz to Guanajuato's famous Callejón del Beso and that iconic scene between Miguel and his great-grandmother. Real-life sites throughout Mexico are replicated on screen in the Disney animated film Coco. The world of the life people is Oaxaca, yes, but the, the world of the dead is Guanajuato. Yes, for the colors, the lights in Guanajuato. But it's not just locations that inspired the film. Mexico's culture and deep traditions played an even bigger role, impacting American audiences in various ways. You know, I think movies like Coco and Tree of Life and the opening to that Bond film, is it Skyfall? Um, they're actually um, indications of something much deeper that's happening. I see much more um, interesting horizons in terms of the way that this tradition has been reawakened in communities that didn't celebrate it 50 years ago. UTSA professors John Philip Santos and Dr. Sonia Aleman agree. Dia de Muertos wasn't widely celebrated in San Antonio the way it is today. Factors like the popularity of Coco and commercialization of the holiday perhaps playing a part. There was a huge learning opportunity both for uh, people of, of Mexican ethnicity and heritage here in the United States when this film came out about that tradition. Um, and that's kind of the way, you know, culture kind of operates and, and, um, and circulates now. For some fans of the film, it's more than just a movie, but a way to find a deeper cultural connection, be it on screen or by visiting these extraordinary sites of Mexico for yourself. Anyone who's interested in, in these kinds of stories should make a trip to Mexico City, to Teotihuacan, to Chichen Itza, 
Um, to see these, these extraordinary um, living monuments to the world that Via de los Muertos is one expression of. Isis Romero, KSAT 12 News. Hey, don't forget that our Day of the Dead Virtual Per River Parade is coming up October 30th. You can watch it live right here on KSAT from 8 to 10 p.m. And time now is 9.38. You're watching GMSA at 9. Last time President Donald Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden faced off uh, in a debate, it was chaotic. So what can we expect from tonight's final debate? CNN's Karen Kafa is standing by live with a preview. Welcome back, 942. President Trump and former Vice President Biden get one more time to share a primetime television stage. And some changes have been made since the last time they met. CNN's Karen Katha is live in Nashville, Tennessee this morning with a preview of tonight's final presidential debate. Good morning. Hi, Karen. Good morning to you guys. Yeah, this is an important one and the dynamic a little bit different than previous last presidential debates of the cycle. More than 40 million Americans have already voted and that means it's entirely possible that someone will wake up tomorrow morning and make their vote deciding it upon what they hear tonight. So a lot on the line for both of these candidates. After a chaotic clash in Cleveland, the, the question Supreme is, Court just is the radical question. left and a hospitalization with COVID-19, President Trump has rallied and rambled his way toward this final debate of 2020. The Biden wins, your borders are gone, which means your health care is gone, the middle class is gone. Your safety is gone. This stage, likely the final opportunity for him to articulate a closing argument for a second term before such a wide national audience with voting already ongoing. Meanwhile, former Vice President Joe Biden has not let up his criticism of President Trump's handling of the pandemic. The president knew how dangerous this virus was all the way back in January. And he hid it from the country. Despite 2020's tumult, national polling in the presidential race has remained steady with Biden in the lead. Biden's plan for tonight, keep things steady. He's going to be ready to talk about his plans. He's going to be ready to talk directly to the American people about his belief that we can get through this crisis. The Commission on Presidential Debates has made some changes for tonight, and President Trump told Fox News he wasn't thrilled. There's nothing fair about this debate, but that's okay. Candidates' microphones will be briefly muted while their opponent gives his two-minute response to each of the six segments' initial questions designed to minimize interruptions. And each of those six segments will be 15 minutes in length, and they will focus around six topics chosen by tonight's moderator, Kristen Welker of NBC News. They are American families, race in America, climate change, national security, leadership, and, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. Mark and Leslie. Karen, President Trump and people close to him who attended the first debate, including the first lady, Melania Trump, tested positive for COVID in the days immediately afterwards. You were also in Cleveland. Are you noticing any additional health precautions there in Nashville? Well, a lot of things look the same in that everybody who came into the perimeter, not just going inside that debate hall behind me, but the perimeter here where the media is, had to test negative for COVID-19 within the last 72 hours or so. You see hand sanitizer stations all over the place here, and everybody, with the exception of when you're reporting actively on air like me right now, needs to have a mask on. Inside the debate hall, they will reinforce that mask rule as well. Remember, there were a number of guests with President Trump who had the masks on when they went into the debate hall in Cleveland and then took them off. As for the candidates themselves, last week in a town hall with ABC News, the former Vice President Joe Biden said he wants President Trump to take a COVID-19 test the day of the debate and test negative. Now, of course, President Trump, just a couple days after that debate in Cleveland, uh, tested positive himself. The White House has not really been forthcoming about his negative test results, so we'll see how that plays out here today. But the Commission on Presidential Debates, which oversees all of this, they want to really reinforce those test results and making sure everybody stays safe on campus here tonight, Mark. And Karen, there are just 12 days left before Election Day. Millions of ballots have already been cast. Is there anything specific either of these candidates hope to achieve on the debate stage tonight? Well, Leslie, something that Republicans, especially those running for their own reelection, would like to hear President Trump articulate is a coherent closing argument. He's been out there on the campaign trail doing those rallies in the battleground states, but it's been very, uh, he, he's, he's kind of rambled and gone off course a little bit, not really given voters who are either undecided or on the sidelines right now a real 
reason to vote for him for a second term. Many Republicans would like to hear him talk up his record on the economy, at least before the pandemic, and therefore why they believe he's best equipped to handle the recovery. As for the former Vice President Joe Biden, it is about maintaining a steadiness in this race. He's maintained a lead in the national polls for months now, and so the goal here is to give a closing argument that gets maybe some more progressive Democrats uh, off the sidelines, maybe those who aligned more with Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren during the primaries a little bit more excited to get out and vote. So we hope to hear that in the messages there tonight from these two candidates as they shape these closing arguments. Again, so many people already in the active process of voting, so the candidates don't really have that luxury of uh, waiting to see what happens in the next 12 days. All right, CNN's Karen Cave alive in beautiful Nashville, Tennessee. Karen, have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Well, back here at home, what do they often tell you when you get on a roller coaster? Keep your hands and feet inside the car at all times. <laughs> That's what we have to do right now, right, Justin? Absolutely. Mother Nature is about to take us for a ride, guys. We're going to be all over the place the next seven days. There's a couple of fronts affect our forecast and affect our weather. Let's take a look at the numbers. Uh, so we're going to start off warm today, 89 degrees, down to 82 tomorrow. And then 70 on Saturday. It looks like Saturday is going to be a little cooler than we first anticipated. Some cloud cover going to help us out there to keep temperatures down. We jump back up Sunday, and then by Monday we're coming back down with our next front. This one's going to be pretty strong. May drop our temperatures into the 60s, if not a little bit cooler. It will also bring some rain chances with it. So that's what we have to look forward to. Take a look at the time lapse. We've had a couple showers here and there this morning. You can see some of the sprinkles there on the live cam. Peaks of sun too. So. Uh, it'll be off and on, mostly cloudy skies. Uh, we're reporting a shower at the airport right now, 76. South southeasterly winds at about 8, dew point is at 70. It's very, very sticky out there. You see the uh, radar becoming a little bit more active just within the last 30 minutes or so. We've noticed some showers down around Pleasanton. Those are lifting north. We've had a couple of light returns around San Antonio and then a scattering of showers from Cuero to Gonzales over to Howitzville and Victoria this morning. Again, just like the last few days, these aren't going to put down much rain. They're quick moving. They last about 30 seconds, maybe to a minute. But uh, it is nice to see some rain on the radar. There are a couple of returns, as I mentioned, up there around Stone Oak and then one little shower that moved right by the airport. A lot of cloud cover, mostly cloudy. There are some peaks of sun there, too. These clouds will scatter out. We'll go partly cloudy later this afternoon. 75 Randolph, 78 Castroville, 72 right now, Bernie Stage, and uh, 75 out in Del Rio. Uh, dew points, no surprise. They're in the low 70s. That's still in the oppressive category. This is October. We need some drier air in here, and that does happen on Saturday. So here's how it plays out. There's our first front. This is tomorrow at 5 o'clock. Should be moving through with it. We can't rule out a shower, but the rain chances are really pretty low. I'll caution you, though, if you're heading out to Friday Night Football tomorrow night, it's going to be breezy. It's going to be turning cooler, uh, so dress appropriately. And as we get into Saturday, it uh, looks like we're going to have a pretty nice cloud deck that will stick around. So for that reason, we've lowered temperatures quite a bit on Saturday. It looks like we'll get some slightly cooler air. And the clouds may try to break up a little bit Saturday afternoon. Sunday is going to be a warm day. We're going to get the humidity back in here, upper 80s in the forecast. And then here's our next front. This one comes with a little better chance of rain. We'll see some showers initially as the front comes through. And then we should see a secondary push of cooler air on Tuesday. Upper level low moves in from the west. All these things coming together, I think, gives us a good situation where we get the overrunning cloudy, cool conditions, and some light showers around. And yes, that is snow up in the Texas Panhandle. That's an absolute possibility. Uh, Amarillo down to Lubbock. And then this system will pull a little bit closer by Tuesday night into Wednesday morning. And our rain chances look pretty decent then as well. So uh, finally, we are getting some rain back in the forecast. But it's going to be chilly, uh, chilly rain, it looks like, uh, by the middle part of next week. 80 degrees noontime, 10% chance of rain today. We'll top out close to 89 southeast Julie winds 5 to 15 and then 82 tomorrow 70 on Saturday. There's that temperature drop 87 Sunday 20% chance of showers Monday, but a 40% chance both Tuesday and Wednesday with highs in the 60s. We'll be right back. Good morning. Hey guys. Coming up on live Laverne Cox will be joining yeah, us. We'll talk with her about her new horror comedy movie Bad Hair. We'll see you soon on live.
And tomorrow on GMSA at 9, how long does it take for mail to go from point A to point B in the same city? As record numbers of people are mailing their ballots through a postal service under scrutiny for recent slowdowns, we decided to find out. Our Marilyn Moritz mailed 100 regular envelopes from different parts of the Alamo City, then waited. She joins us live tomorrow at 9 to debrief what she found out. Yeah, well, let's look at the forecast. We're at 77 right now, up around 90 this afternoon. But changes start to arrive tomorrow. We'll get a cold front that'll cool us down a little bit, uh, quite a bit actually on Saturday, and then some cooler air and possibly rainy conditions next week. All right, if you have trick or treaters, grab a pen and paper or the notes on your phone so you can take little quick notes about where we're going to have uh, Walmart Super Centers hosting a trick or treat drive through experience. Yeah, this happening is happening in different locations across the city. So uh, they're going to host that trick or treat drive through experience while complying with COVID-19 safety protocols. Mm -hmm. Kids and their parents are invited to dress up seasons most popular costumes available at Walmart head to Walmart for the free Halloween events and it's at three San Antonio area Walmarts and they're taking place on October 29th, 30th and 31st. So on the 29th, it'll be from 1 to 7 at the Supercenter on 1603 Vance Jackson. Uh, from 1 to 7 October 30th at the Supercenter at 8030 Bandera Road. And on Halloween from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. at the San Antonio Walmart Supercenter at 1200 Southeast Military Drive. We know that's a lot to take down. And for more on the participating locations of the San Antonio area, Walmart Supercenters participating in this trick or treat drive through, you can find the article at KZ.com. Glad we have the options. <laughs> me too. Me too. It's good to have options this yes. year, isn't it? Yeah. It definitely is. Have a great day, guys.